If hockey is Canada's game, Willie O'Ree is a trailblazer who should be a household name. In 1958, he became the first black hockey player to hit the ice in an NHL game, wearing a Boston Bruins uniform in a game at the fabled Montreal Forum against Les Canadiens. A new documentary, simply titled Willie, chronicles his journey and what it took to break the color barrier more than 60 years ago. Joining us now for more on the man and the film, director, producer, and cinematographer Laurence Mathieu Léger. It's so great to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Not at all. Shall we see a little bit of your work before we yeah, talk? Yeah, let's do it. Sheldon, if you would, this is me directing now. Sheldon, the clip, s'il vous plaît. In terms of this business of being the Jackie Robinson of hockey, have you had any troubles? Willie O'Ree of the Boston Bruins is the first Negro to play in the National Hockey League. Sixty years ago, Willie O'Ree broke the color barrier in professional hockey. He changed the game forever. Why don't we have Willie O'Ree in the Hockey Hall of Fame? I had my opportunity because of people like Willie O'Ree. He was blind in one eye. I played with a lot of guys who weren't very good who had two eyes. <laughs> you know, you'd be sitting in the penalty box and you'd hear the racial slur. Someone called me an N-word on the ice. I don't stand for that. Willie is a hero. He's a hockey hero. It took us a long time to appreciate this hockey hero because he lived in kind of anonymity for a long time. So let's tell a bit of his story. Willie, from a very early age apparently, said, I want to play in the NHL despite the fact that there were no other black players in the NHL. Where did that come from? You know, Willie started skating when he was about three years old, and he's from Fredericton, New Brunswick, where um, hockey is literally part of the culture. It's winter for a very long time over there, as mm -hmm. you may know. And uh, when he was 14, he made a promise to himself that he would play professional hockey and play in the National Hockey League. Um, he says this story often, but um, it was incredible to believe that at the time because there were no black hockey players in the National Hockey mm -hmm. League. There were black hockey players in other leagues, in Quebec, for example, with Herb Carnegie and the Black Line. But um, for him to have this dream and, um, and make it possible, it was incredible. Even more incredible was the fact that during one minor hockey league game, he got an eye put out. He played in the NHL with one eye. Right. How does uh, one do that? Well, listen, um, Willie became blind in 1956 in an incident that happened in Kitchener, Ontario. And um, everyone kind of thought it was just a random accident. And uh, the doctor told him that he'd be blind in one eye and never play hockey again. And uh, Willie, you know, had a desire that he wanted to accomplish. And he knew that if he would tell anyone uh, that it would not come true. And so he kept it a secret hmm. and never told anyone, went back on the ice and, uh, and made the National Hockey and League. And somehow managed to do it. Right. I want to read something here from Wayne Simmons, who used to play with the Philadelphia Flyers. He's an Ontario guy. He's uh, now with the Nashville Preds. And he had this to say about Willie in the Players' Tribune. He said, my parents started teaching me about Willie O'Ree, the first black player to play in the NHL. It was one of the most important history lessons of my life. Without Willie, there would be no Jerome Ginla, there would be no Grant Fuhr, or P.K. Subban, or Ray Emery, or Dustin Bufflin, or so many others who have had the honor of playing in this great league. There would definitely be no Wayne Simmons. None of it ever would have happened without Mr. O'Ree opening the door, not just for me, but for every black hockey player with a dream. Does Willie get that? I mean, absolutely. And, and to, to be clear, it took 16 years before there was another black player in the National Hockey mm -hmm. League. So it's not like Willie arrived and then suddenly like black players flooded in. It, it took a long time. And, um, and, and you know, it's not just Willie breaking that barrier. You know, Willie for the past 22 years has been a diversity ambassador in the National Hockey League and he travels across North America and talks to young boys and girls about his experience and inspires them. And so I, I really think that um, Willie is aware that his message is important and has some positive repercussion on the game and on society as well because it's it's not just in hockey that there's an issue with diversity or racism you know and and, um, and his work is from hockey outwards and a lot of players see Willie as the pioneer and they want to carry his legacy and honor it. I want to make the comparison to baseball because he met Jackie Robinson a couple of times. Right. And you've got this wonderful story in the movie where he talks about meeting Jackie right. and then meeting him again years later and Jackie remembered. Right. Uh, Jackie broke in in 47, but three months later, there was a second black player, Larry Doby with the Cleveland Indians. You point out it was a decade and a half 
before the NHL had its second black player, Mike Marson, who was in that chair a couple of years ago. Why do you think it took the NHL so long to have number two? I think there's different reasons. Um, you know, hockey is not a sport that is accessible for a ton of people. Um, and It's expensive to play. Right, and, and it's also a sport that was primarily played um, in Canada in those days and in the northern parts of the U.S. And so in terms of accessibility, I think um, potentially not a lot of black players had an access to the game. Now, why did it take so long? You know, I think people associate hockey as a white man's sport. Um, I'm sure there were a ton of other barriers that made it difficult because, you know, I always say, like, for every racist act that you hear on the news. There's a, a, a lot more thousands that you never hear about. So who knows, maybe there were other incredible black players that were out there after Willie that didn't get a chance hmm. because no one wanted to give them a chance. And that's a, a real possibility. Ja uh, Jackie Robinson's story has been well told many times over, as it should be. Uh, and, and his travails were well known, uh, the kind of racism he faced. Did Willie face similar stuff when he was coming up in the NHL? I mean, absolutely. I mean, when Willie came in the NHL, it was 1958. And for many Canadians that might not be familiar with what's happening in the, the United States at the time, um, it was kind of the end of Jim Crow, which is segregation by law, and also um, a time of uh, the civil rights movement was, was coming together in a big way. And there was a lot of racial tension. So, so what Willie had to face in terms of... Uh, in, in terms of climate was pretty intense. And, um, and also like discrimination also exists in Canada, even though Jim Crow is not in place. And so I think there was a ton of barriers that he had to push through. And, and that, you know, for a lot of us, it's hard to understand. Mm. Um, and then he was focused, he was focused and he made it. And, and we really highlight that in the film in a and, big way. You're from Montreal, aren't you? I grew up in Montreal, Okay, yes. because Jackie Robinson played his minor league baseball in Montreal. And he said he was glad he did because he thought Montreal was a much less racist city than all the places in the States that he ended up playing. You've got a great interview with Willie in the movie in which he talks about an incident, 1961, with a player with the Chicago Blackhawks. Let's play a clip of that, okay? And yeah, then we'll come back it. and chat. I'm going to do some directing again here. This is so exciting to direct great. in front of a director. Perfect. Sheldon, if you would, please. He made a couple of racial remarks and comes out from my blind side and I can't see him. And he holds uh, about six inches out of his stick and he butt ends me in the in the mouth, knocks, splits my nose, splits my lip, knocks my two front teeth out. He just stood there and laughed. Now, Branch Rickey always told Jackie Robinson, I want a player who's tough enough not to fight back. Do you know whether Willie's preferred approach was to do the same or whether it was to beat the other guy's brains in? So Willie often says that if he would um, answer to every racial remarks, he would have been in a pe penalty box every time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for Willie, I mean, in situations like that, he would fight back. He said if someone would assault him physically, he would fight back. But then he couldn't fight back every, everything that people would say to him, otherwise he wouldn't play. And, you know, we've heard some, some comments from people who watch the film saying, yeah, why didn't Willie fight back more? I mean, that, this is Willie's message. If you listen to everything that comes to you, then you won't get to your end goal. And so, and, and also at the time, you know, there, there was so many um, pressure coming from white viewers, white, white audiences, that it, Willie can focus all his energy on that. He had to play hockey and that's why he succeeded. Now that might not be true today because now the NHL is behind, you know, what happened to Devontae smith Pelly. As soon as like the, uh, the, the crowd that was, you know, yelling racial slurs at him, were pointed out they were ejected from the from the the stadium you in should Chicago. Just say, that was in Chicago. Yeah, right. Smith Pelly's uh, an Ontario kid too, I think. Yes, exactly. He was with the Washington Capitals. Uh, there's the headline from the online service as it came out. Uh, I guess he got the last laugh. Eh? He hoisted the Stanley Cup over his head for the Washington he Capitals did, last year. Which you know we use yeah. the story in the film as sort of a modern story of mm -hmm. of, of resilience and perseverance. But um, you know, in, in Devo's case, in Devonte Smith Pelly's case the NHL acted immediately. There was immediate support and, um, and players from all over the league said it's unacceptable. Back in Willie's days, um, you know, I think racial um, uh, events like the ones Willie faced were not immediately addressed. And I think that speaks to the time we're in. There's been some progress, but um, there's a lot of way to go. Well, okay, I'm glad you said the last part because you want to bring this one up, Sheldon? Here's pick 12. 
Uh, this happened in Quebec. This happened in Quebec earlier this year. A right. Quebec hockey player and his family taunted by racist fans. Uh, the the N-word used. Comparisons to baboons. Um, the player's family was forced to leave the game because of all of that unwanted attention. Um, you know, we do have a long way to go still, don't we? You know, um, it's interesting because this event right here, when I watch it, I find it disgusting, obviously. But what bothers me most is not really that one guy who's taunting the player. It's everyone that's kind of sitting there and saying nothing. Mm. And I like to say, you know, especially as white people and white privileged people, our role is to stand up. And you, and you can be silent because you're aiding and abating. Mm. And I think, I think that's the message in the film. Um, you know, Willie has a ton of white friends that support him and, and help him to get to the, the Hockey Hall of Fame and they love him and they acknowledge that racism is still real and still going on. And in the film, you know, we see them as allies and I, that's an important word. And I think our role to, to make a change, not just in hockey, but in society is not mm. to just stand by and say nothing. You might say I'm not a racist, but, but you know, as long as we stay silent, these things are gonna keep happening. Let's go, Sheldon, let's show a few pictures here, shall we? And Laurence, you can look up at the monitor up there. Let's see Willie. Pick four Willie with the Quebec Aces. Now, Jean Beliveau played for the Quebec Aces, too, I believe. There he is there. Boy, he's a good-looking hockey player, wasn't he? Jean Beliveau also played with Herb Carnegie, who was the... Uh... Okay, we got a shot of that next. Let's put up Herb Carnegie. And this is on... Now, this is, um, this is number 10. Is this the um, Sherbrooke team? What's the Sherbrooke team called? I forget now. Anyway. The Black Line. That's the... They call them the Black Line. Right. Herb Carnegie, who actually was the first guy on ice, I think, the first black man on ice, but he didn't play in the NHL. And then let's do one more. Here's the Quebec Aces, and that's, that's Herb Carnegie again. And Herb Carnegie really needs his due. At some, I don't know if you're going to make another film, but he needs his due as well as a significant person. He really does. Yeah. We, we talk about his story a bit in the film yeah. um, because it's important, but there's a much bigger story in Herb Carnegie's story, and it's been touched on in shorter documentaries on the CBC and whatnot. But, um, you know, Herb didn't get a, a shot to play in the NHL for racial reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think there's another story to tell here because he was an incredible player and he left a lasting legacy. And, um, and Willie sees him as, as one of his heroes, really. Now, Willie played professional hockey. Right. Um, into his 40s. Right. I mean, he had a long run, but he didn't play that long in the NHL. Do you know why that was the case? Well, you know, I mean, at the time there was only six teams and not a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Willie uh, was an amazing player. And we have to remember he was blind in one eye again. Mm -hmm. And that limited him. Uh, and he still was able to go in the NHL, score some goals. Now, when Willie got traded um, in 1961, I believe, he got traded to the Montreal Canadiens. And then he never really played. He, you know, it wasn't up to him. Mm -hmm. um, and again, at the time, there was only six teams. So a lot of the other teams in the other leagues ended up being part of the NHL anyways, mm -hmm. later down the road. Um, but nevertheless, he had an, an extremely long and, and uh, prolific career. He broke some, some scoring records in, in some of the other leagues, despite his, his disability mm -hmm. of being blind in one eye. And, and played well in his 40s and was absolutely loved on the West Coast where he made a lasting impression and, and his jersey was retired in San Diego. Hmm. Willie's in the Hall of Fame. Right. It took a long time to get Willie in the Hall of Fame, but Willie's in the Hall of Fame right now is obviously one of the pioneers and builders in the game. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to him? You know, <clears throat> I think Willie didn't anticipate immediately to go in the Hall of Fame because a lot of people say, oh, he's only played 45 games. But it's not just, first of all, the fact that he broke the color barrier should qualify him immediately anyways. But there, there's, there's this, you know, these were the argument against him going into the hall. Now, um, Willie did play 22 years of professional hockey and then was kind of forgotten and did other jobs. And when he returned to the NHL, his impact has been incredible on the game. And um, when there was some talk that he might go into the hall, I think he, he didn't want to believe it because he didn't want to be disappointed. But it, you know, everyone agrees that it took way too long for him to get in. And uh, I w had the opportunity and the privilege to be with him the day he got the call. Um, and we, at some point, thought we didn't, we weren't going to get the call because it took well, so long. They made him wait, didn't they? They made him wait. They <laughs> made everyone wait because, really, even though there's speculation, you know, the 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 committee meets that day and they make the decisions on who goes into the hall that day on June 26 every year. And so, even though people are like, for sure you're getting in, there's always a chance you're not. 
And so, um, you know, this was a really emotional day, an emotional moment, and uh, I think it sort of was round circle for Willie, right? I, I got the sense it was almost more important to his friends than for him. They cared, they cared certainly as much as, maybe more than he did about seeing this man get his due. He's got lovely friends, doesn't he, who really care a lot about him. A theme in the film, an important theme is friendship. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the film is about Willie's story and, and, and hockey, but again, hockey is, is it's not a hockey film. It, it really highlights the importance of community, of sticking up for each other, and especially in, in Willie's case, who was one of the only black kids in Fredericton when he grew up, it shows the power of friendship and community in making something amazing happen. And Willie got into the Hall of Fame on his own merit, but his friends really helped with the process and, and the support, and that was really important to show that friendship and community is really important in anything that you accomplish as a person. He's 83 years old now. Right. He's Is he still a diversity ambassador for the National Hockey Absolutely. League? Absolutely. He still is. So he's out there, he's going to rinks, he's going to games, yep. he's, he's talking to young kids, he's trying to bring the game to the inner city and that kind of thing. Right. How, how does he still have the passion to keep doing this at this stage of the game? I think Willie feels a lot of purpose. And, um, you know, he, I, I'll repeat his words, but he has a saying that, you know, find a job that you love and you'll never work a day of your life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think when Willie stopped playing hockey and did other jobs like managing a fast food uh, restaurant or selling cars or working at the security at a hotel, he always had a, a burning desire in him that he wanted to give back. And that's who Willie is. He's like a selfless person who wants to make a contribution. And so um, he just loved what he does. When he got that call from the NHL, he had a feeling he was gonna go back there and he went back there and he just loves to share his story and make an impact. And that is really his legacy. It is the fact that he's still living. He's this living hero who did this incredible thing, but his main focus is to give back. In our last minute here, I want to ask you about how he felt about being the subject of a documentary. Because w when I saw the premiere the other night and I saw you guys do the Q&A afterwards, he's a very modest guy. Absolutely. How does he feel about all this attention? I mean, Willie cried like half of the, the time during the <laughs> premiere. He was yeah. so moved. Um, and listen, for me, it's been an absolute privilege to work with Willie, to get to be friends with Willie. I can, I'm so proud I can call him my friend. And... Um, you know, we had to build trust for him to, to feel comfortable, and, and that took not very long. And um, I think Willie hadn't seen the full cut until we had the premiere. And uh, I think he's feeling um, that, you know, again, it's, it's coming around circle. It, it took so long. Like, Willie is having a thrill year. He had a thrill year last year. But it's about time, you know? And he's 83 years old. Let's celebrate him. Too often people die and we celebrate them after. So, um, you know, he won't say that, but I think it, it's well overdue that we celebrate him and people that are not into hockey need to watch the film anyways because it, it's about so much more. I agree. It was fabulous. Um, Thank you. Not a dry eye on the house the night I went there. I mean, there's so many tender moments. Anyway, you did a great job with it. I appreciate it. Thank That's you. That's Laurence Mathieu Léger, and she is the director, producer, and cinematographer of Willy, and as they say, don't walk, run to theaters to go see it. Merci, Laurence. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.